Michael. I'll tell you some more about that. We're based in Kansas City, Missouri, and we're in a church plant, Fountain City Baptist uh, in Kansas City. I've been in Kansas City for 30 years. I grew up in New Jersey. That's how I know the Hams, the Lindsays. And uh, I went to Gloucester County Christian School. So if you hear me say things like, you know, have you seen my daughters or, you know, want a glass of water, uh, that would be where I grew up. I don't talk like that now. I live in Missouri. Nobody would understand me. But anyway, that's a little bit of my background. Okay, we're in Matthew 13. Matthew 13. I am mindful to turn off my phone. You may want to do the same or turn it on quiet. Uh, I was in a church one time. Phone went off. And, of course, the guy couldn't find it. And now everybody's amused because it's the elephant in the room. And it kept ringing. It was that awkward moment, you know, and I kind of joked. I said, I think it's the devil calling. And he finally found it. He said, it's my mother-in-law. So I decided I shouldn't say it's the devil. (laughs) So we don't want the devil or your mother-in-law calling during the service. You ever notice we live in a time period, there is more access to the Bible and Bible material than there's ever been. And this week I was using my, an app on my, um, uh, my iPad and it's the Bible, it's a, it's a, I forget which Bible app it is, but I'm, I'm playing my Bible audio while I'm reading along, and then if there's a word in the text, I want to see a definition, just touch it, it pops the definition up. I mean, unbelievable. I've got Bible apps on my phone, I've got Bible, study Bibles, you know, I've got Bible material. As a kid growing up, I remember every time we traveled, you'd find there'd be Christian radio stations all across the country. Christian broadcasting, you'd hear the gospel even on TV. I know, I know there's you know, a lot of watered-down truth out there, but you can hear the gospel on television. You could get it in print. We've never lived, uh, there's never been a time period there was more access to the Bible than there is today. I think that's uncontested. There's never been more readily available gospel. You can't stay in a hotel without finding the Bible for free. The Gideons put them in the hotel, lo- in the hotel room everywhere. And yet, godliness is at an all-time low. Isn't that ironic? More Bible access than ever, and yet it's so rare to meet a truly godly person, Christ-like person. David said it well when he said, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. The faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. That's in Psalm 12, and that could have been written for today. So why is it that there's such a rarity of godliness, of Christ-likeness? My burden as an evangelist is seeing revival in our churches. What's revival? It's just being restored to what should be the norm in Christian living, vibrant, holy, godly, passionate living for the Savior. So what, what gives? Why do we not see it? I want to give you a message I've entitled, Grounds. For growth and godliness. Grounds for growth and godliness. I think the reason we're seeing such a dearth of godly living, of Christ-likeness, is that we're not receiving the word into properly prepared hearts. It's not the lack of Bible material. I, I know you get sound Bible preaching, but the pastor can't make you be godly. The evangelist coming through can't make you godly. Your camp counselor can't make you be godly if you go to a Christian camp. So how does that come about? I believe the answer is given in Jesus' parable of the sower. We're going to go to the Matthew account. Now, it's interesting. The the parable of the sower is mentioned in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You may remember those are called the synoptic Gospels. Have you heard the term synoptic? Okay, synoptic. So, S-Y-N, sin, like synchronize. If we synchronize our watches, we get them all in the same time, right? Uh, Synonym means words that mean the same. Okay, so sin is same. Optic, I wear contact lenses, so thankfully I can see all you well because I'm nearsighted. I could read fine, but I wouldn't see you very well. So optic has to do with the eyes. So synoptic means to see the same. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptics. Why? Well, they're pretty much traditional biographies. They report the deeds and the statements of Jesus where John is an apologetic approach. John really goes into the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, you can figure out that Jesus is God from any of the four Gospels. But John particularly focuses on the deity of the Savior. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's a lot of uh, overlap uh, by design, by God's design, all obviously given by inspiration of God. We could look at all the uh, accounts. For sake of time, I'm going to compare the Matthew and the Luke account today, okay? So you'd find the parable, Matthew 13, Mark chapter 4, and Luke chapter 8. Those are the three places for the parable of the sower. 
Let's look at Matthew 13. I'll make this our primary text today. And uh, begin, it, begin reading here in verse 1 to get the parable. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him. So he went into a ship and sat. The whole multitude stood on the shore, and he spake many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. When he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. The fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith, right away, they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. When the sun was up, they were scorched. Because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns. The, thorn, the thorns sprung up and choked them. Other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. I mentioned my dad being at Home Depot, and uh, he worked there for uh, a couple decades. After he died, and he died age 65, so unexpectedly. And I remember going through some of his personal things. He had Bibles that he had written notes in, and he had notebooks full of Scripture. And one notebook just written out scripture, and it was lots of parables. And I asked my mom, what was, uh, what was dad doing with this notebook? She said, oh, he'd memorize verses, and then he'd write them out because he wanted to make sure he got them down perfectly. I said, mom, I didn't ever see too many people memorize parables. Was this a class for college? She said, no, dad figured out. At the workplace, sometimes there'd be conflicts between people. He'd say, oh, that reminds me of a parable Jesus told. And they'd say, what's a parable? Well, parable is an earthly story that conveys some heavenly truth. For example, and he would quote the parable verbatim. Of course, their mouth would drop wide open like, this guy's a walking Bible. And then they would ask him, well, what would you do in this situation? And he'd take them to the Bible. So he was using parables as an evangelistic tool. Now, Jesus used parables to simply impart heavenly truth through the medium of, the medium of stories. He would tell a and by the way, these stories are not just, you know, outlandish. They're common, everyday things. This particular incident is at the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. That's where five of the disciples were from. You may remember Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew, the tax collector, all were from the town of Capernaum. Five of the 12 came from this town. 2001, I had the privilege to go on a, my one and only trip to Israel, and evangelist Tom Farrell was the host. And uh, Jimmy DeYoung was the man from Israel that we met over there, and it was pretty eye-opening. And I remember one night, Brother Farrell came, and he said, Okay, Rich, we're going to be in Capernaum tonight. How would you like to preach? I said, Well, I'd love it. He said, Sunday night, we're gonna have, we'll do our own service, and we'll be at the Sea of Galilee. So he said, Now, now Rich, I'm going to tell you, I don't know how well people will be paying attention, because you'll have your back to the sea. Everybody's going to be looking out there where they know all these incidents of Jesus' life. But he said, I'd love you to have the opportunity. I said, I, I'd relish it. Thanks. So I got to, to preach, and I remember thinking about this parable when I was at that location, because as Jesus is on the, the ship, the boat, you know, the fishing boat, and he's seated, he must have had a powerful set of lungs, because people have come by the hundreds. And as he preaches, he says, behold, a sower went forth to sow. Well, see, Galilee there, Capernaum has a lot of hilly agricultural fields to this day. And it wouldn't surprise me if Jesus said, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now, probably those of you who've grown up with a biblical background, you know the sower had a big bag of seed around his neck. Any of you remember um, using a, a bag with fertilizer or seed with a hand crank? Anybody ever do that? Okay. How many of you remember when we used to have paper boys that delivered the news to people's houses in a paper bag? Yeah. Any of you do that? I was a paper boy. Anybody else? Okay. Kids are like, What? You know, we just shake the phone and get the app. Okay, yeah, we used to deliver the newspaper to people's homes. The sower would have this big bag around his neck. There'd be seed in it. Eh, you've probably seen groups like, you know, bearing precious seed. They've got the emblem of the sower. And he's, he takes his seed in his fist, and he just scatters it. And as Jesus is giving the account here, giving the story, he, he may have gestured to a person doing this. They all knew this was familiar. He mentions four types of ground here, and I circled them in my Bible, and he's going to explain this further down the passage. In verse 4, he talks about those by the wayside. I circled that, by the wayside. Verse 5, stony places. Verse 7, among thorns. And then uh, verse number 8, good ground. Okay, so there are four types of ground. We're going to get dive into this in a minute. Let's go down now to his explanation. It's in verse 18. He says, hear you therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. 
This is he that receives seed by the wayside. But he that receives seed in the stony places is, he, is the same that heareth the word, and anon, immediately, right away, anon, with joy, receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but doeth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he's offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. He becometh unfruitful. But he that receives seed into, good, into the good ground is he that heareth the word, and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let's dive into the explanation. I'm, uh, it's going to be really simple. If you want to follow along, there are four points, because there are four types of ground, okay? I'm calling it grounds for growth and godliness. We're going to start with number one, wayside ground. Wayside ground. It's in verses 18 to 19 that we find the explanation. We're in Matthew 13, if you're joining us. Uh, Matthew 13, 18 And I'm going to give a description to each of the types of ground. I'm going to call this one snatched seed. Think of a purse snatcher, okay, somebody who grabs something. Snatched seed. Now, in the parable, you go back to verse number four, he talks about when he sowed, some fell by the wayside, the fowls came and devoured them up. What is the seed here? In verse 18, interesting, uh, I want to comment on this. He says he calls it the parable of the sower. If you you read any... uh, commentaries at length, you'll find a lot of them call it the parable of the soil. And I, I know why they do that, because you're, really it is in a divergence of, of responses, difference of responses, and we tend to focus on the responses. We tend to focus on, okay, this is, a, Jesus called it parable of the sower. I thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder why he did that. Perhaps he's looking at it from the perspective of the one giving the word is giving good seed no matter what the response is. The sower is giving incorruptible truth. He's giving good stuff. And the sower, who's the sower? That, that's the soul winner, the person who witnesses to his neighbor. That's the pastor preaching. That's the Sunday school teacher. That's the Bible conference person. That's the lecturer who's teaching the Bible. Whoever's teaching the Bible, that's the discipleship class leader. Okay, whoever the person is giving the Bible, the seed's good. But, boy, responsibility falls on the hearer. You know, you, you wouldn't want an evangelist to come in this week who's kind of, uh, oh, uh, well, we'll just open up the Bible and we'll figure out something. I have a responsibility to be prepared, right? And by the way, I find it my responsibility to be engaging. Not Preaching is not just getting up here and talking like Charlie Brown's teacher. Remember what she sounded like? Or how they heard her was wop, 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 wop. Okay, nobody wants to listen to that. But while the preacher has a responsibility to be prepared, scriptural, and dynamic, what about the hearer? And it falls on you and me this week as responders to God's word to make proper response. So in giving the explanation, he says here in verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, catch the way that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. Okay, mark your place here. Let's jump to the Luke account. We're going to compare parable is given in the first part of the book of Luke. The explanation is given, if you slide on down to verse 11. Okay, so the, the chapter opens with the parable. Now we're gonna, our interest here is in the explanation. Chapter 8, verse 11 in Luke. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Okay, folks, let me ask you something. What does the seed represent? You guys are great. Okay, brilliant. Not hard, right? Jesus interprets it for us. The seed represents the word. I, I grew up working on a farm in New Jersey. Our closest friends in New Jersey are the Griffin family, and they own a farm called Roundtree Farm. And um, I have known the Griffin since my childhood. In fact, my grandmother married their grandfather after they were both widow and widower, and so there's quite a connection between the families. Uh, when I worked on Roundtree Farm, my job in the spring was pretty simple. It went to seed sowing time. We had these giant John Deere tractors. Our friend Dave had really debilitating uh, rheumatoid arthritis. His hands have been drawn shut since I was a kid, as far back as I can remember. He's had knees replaced, hips replaced. He has one leg that he has to lock in place with a brace. He's got a platform shoe to equal out his balance. And uh, Dave has been ravaged by arthritis, and yet he loves farming. And so when I was a kid, I remember he, he would drive the tractors, do the planting, was not going to be deterred. Had these steel ladders welded to his John Deere tractor, painted John Deere green so he could get up and down the ladders, and that was, that was Dave's happy place. And so he'd hire high school kids to help him, 
it was good for the high school kids, but it was helpful to him. In the springtime, I remember I'd rip open the bags, and my job was to keep the, the planter or the hopper filled up with the, with the seeds. So we were planting corn. He'd make the runs up and down the row, so I'd keep the hoppers filled. But it's interesting, when he would make the turn, he'd come down the, the side road, which is the dirt road where we'd run tractors, we'd run the cows up and down there. I'd get all packed down. That's the wayside. It was no different in the 20th century, now the 21st century, as it was in the 1st century. And so the, the wayside is where people would travel, and, you know, it wasn't plowed up. It wasn't, it wasn't prepared for, for seed. But sometimes when Dave would make the turn, seeds would fall out as he was coming back to make another pass. Guess who would show up as the cleaning committee? Birds, yeah. Same, same when I was in high school as in Jesus' day. Birds are showing up. Okay, what's the picture? Well, you go back here to Luke 8 verse 12, those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. All right, so I wrote down wayside ground, call it snatch seed. Let me give you two observations, and I'll do this with each type of ground, okay? And this is not an academic approach, but I want you to just break it down in your mind. There's an application here. First of all, the seed is sown, the word is heard. By the way, if you get letter A for this point, you'll get it for the next three points as well because it's going to be the same. The seed is sown, the word is heard. In each type of ground, that's true. These people cannot claim, well, I didn't know. I never heard that. Okay, the seed's sown, the word's heard. And by the way, the seed is obviously the word of God. Seed equals the word of God. Um, Matthew called it the word of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Here it's called the word of God. It is the message by which people can be saved. The gospel. So the gospel is the word, or the seed is the word of God. But then I want you to notice this. In this particular case, B, the seed is snatched, the word is wasted. The seed snatched, the word is wasted. Okay, so sower's out there tossing seed. Obviously, his goal is to put it where the ground's been plowed up. But as he's sowing, whether, you know, misdirected or wind is blowing, some seed goes off and it's in the wayside. Birds come and snatch it up. Normal thing, but there's an application. The birds picture the work of somebody else. And we're told in the text, who is the person or the being who's snatching the seed? The devil, yeah. Matthew calls him the wicked one. The devil, Satan. This is not just some story, folks. This is a, this is a reality that goes on. In fact, we've talked about one of my favorite things to do during a week of meetings like this is to have a pre-service prayer meeting. And we'll start that, uh, typically I start on weeknights. Are we going to Monday through Friday? The plan would be 6.30 before the evening service. If any of you can get here, most of the people that will labor with us in the prayer times, they'll say, man, I, I got as much out of the prayer time as I did anything all week. I don't take that as an insult. We're laboring together. And you know one of the reasons we're having those prayer times? Jesus very pointedly said, without me, you can do what? Nothing, Nothing yeah, John 15, 5. I know this, every time I preach, there's a battle going on. The preacher will say, your pastor will tell you, when you preach, you know there's a battle going on. Now, people are not standing up heckling. Most people here are not crossing their arms and looking at me sideways like, just try to prove it to me. But there's a battle going on, a battle of distractions, a battle of unbelief or disbelief. And Satan ultimately is behind it. He's the master of diversion, deception, delusion. He is the deceiver. And when the preacher's preaching, I want to tell you, one of the things to pray this week is, God, please get a hold of my heart. Please work in my spouse, work in my kids, work in my grandkids, work in our school. God, please do a work. Because just the fact that the word is being preached does not mean anybody's life is going to change. The word's got to be received in a properly prepared ground. Interestingly, in this case, we're very frankly told the result of this, those by the wayside hear, then come the devil, take away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be what? Saved. Not everybody who hears the word of God is saved. Boy, that always concerns me. Well, what about in church? I'm going to deal with this in the morning service, but, you know, Jesus had a dozen disciples called apostles, and one of them wasn't even saved. And it wasn't because of the quality of the teaching. How do you get better teaching than Christ? And yet Judas was a def defector to the faith. He didn't believe the truth. Whenever the preaching goes on, the responsibility of the preacher is to preach it faithfully, true to the text, true to what God says, hopefully with a dynamic presentation that doesn't distract you from the Bible but makes you all the more drawn into it. 
That's on his part. But your part, God, what do you want me to do with this? Same thing when you have your quiet time. That's why I, I keep notes, and I'll write devotional insights each day. This is how you meditate. That means to chew the cud. Okay, this is how you meditate every day. Get something to write down as you're reading the Bible. Look for an application. Look for an insight to break it down, chew the cud, ruminate on it. So the devil's deception, his intention is to deceive you so you, ah, you just dis dismiss it. Don't regard it. Disbelieve it. That's the wayside ground. Have you ever known kids that grew up even in a Christian school and were not saved? I have been in literally, it's, I wouldn't be an exaggeration, I've been in hundreds of Christian schools. When I graduated from PCC, I worked as a college rep for the school for uh, three and a half years. One of those was missionary schools around the world. In evangelism, I preach in Christian schools all the time. I've been in 30 years doing this. I can tell you, literally, hundreds of Christian schools. And there are so many cases I know of kids that grew up in fine families, in Bible-preaching churches, in sound Christian schools, and they want nothing to do with Christ. Why? Exposure to the truth does not equate to personal salvation. It's got to be believed. It's got to be accepted. What about you? There's the wayside ground. But then I want you to go back to Matthew, and we'll come back and forth to Luke. So Matthew 13 I want you to see a second type of ground. That is the stony ground. And I call this one scorched seed. Scorched seed. It's in verses 20 and 21. All right, Matthew 13. Look at verse 20 with me. He that receives seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but doeth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he's offended. Okay, this is stony ground. Now, I want you to notice the pattern here. Okay, the seed is sown, the word is heard. That's true again, all right? So I wrote that down. Hey, seed is sown, word is heard. In fact, in this case, notice it's, it's immediately received, and it's glad to receive it. I worked on the farm. In the springtime, after the winter uh, snow had come and after the heavy rains had come, we'd have to go out and clear the fields of rocks because the snow and rain would wash away topsoil and rocks would be exposed, and rocks are not good for plows, they'll beat it up. So we'd take a wagon, and we'd go get all the big rocks out of there. Also, you'd find certain places where topsoil had been eroded, and all you got is a layer of shale, which is shallow rock, thin rock, you know, and you know, okay, we're not going to plant corn there, or hay there, because it's not going to grow, right? You all remember, probably going back to kindergarten, anybody ever remember planting uh, seeds in a Dixie cup and growing little seedlings? Okay. Everything you need to know, you learned in kindergarten, right? When you plant seed, actually what happens is the seed rots. Uh, remember Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Okay, so basic plant uh, recollections here. When you plant a seed, it rots. Out comes a tap root. The tap root goes down into the soil, and the tap root produces... Well, it depends what you plant. If you plant apple seeds, you get apple trees. You plant corn seed, you get corn. Okay, so everything produces after its kind. But the taproot has to go down and root. What happens if the taproot comes out and it hits rock? It's got nowhere to go. So what should have flourished ends up getting killed because there's no depth to it, no place for the roots to go. That's the picture here. So I, I jotted down the seed sown. The word's heard, but then the seed is scorched, the word is withered. The seed scorched, the word is withered. Jump over to Luke, see how Jesus described it here. Luke chapter uh, 8 again and verse number, thir uh, verse number 13. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. These have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. That's interesting. For a while believe, but in time of temptation fall away. What does that mean, and for a while believe? Let's compare that to the, the gospel account, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. Okay, so I'm, I'm staying with Holly Ham this week, Sarah's dad, Sarah Lindsay's dad. And um, I'll never forget one time, I was in high school, and I'm walking down the hallway, and Coach Ham, is my, he's my, he was my coach for every sport I played, okay? We're <laughs> small Christian school at the time. So he is my basketball coach, baseball coach, soccer coach, and, uh, and phys ed teacher. So one day I'm walking down the hall, and he says, hey, bud. I said, yeah, coach. He said, what's the gospel? I said, Mr. Ham, are you not saved? He's like, oh. 
Rich, I'm saved. I said, Coach, you think I'm not saved? He's like, no, I didn't say that. I said, well, you're asking me what the gospel is. He said, well, you're going to be a preacher. You better know what the gospel is. I said, okay. He said, what's the gospel? I said, uh, Jesus died for our sins. He said, and? I said, well, it's all what he did. He said, brother, you haven't given me the gospel. And he took me to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. Notice this. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you've received, wherein you stand, by which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you've believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And Holy looked, Mr. Ham looked at me and said, Rich, listen, you tell people Jesus died, that's great, but that's not, the, that's not all of it. He said, notice, he died, he was buried, but brother, he rose again. And he said, the, the apostles always preached the resurrection. If you don't go to the, get to the resurrection, you haven't given them the gospel. I've never forgotten that. And it's interesting, the gospel is that he died, but he didn't just die. It wasn't just some tragic death. He died, why? Not for his wrongdoing. He died for our sins and then was buried. That proved he was dead. And then he rose again. He was raised for our justification. Interesting, though, right in the middle of all this explanation, Paul says in verse 1, I declare to the gospel, I circled that. What's the word gospel mean? The what news? The good news, yeah. I declare the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you receive, wherein you stand, by which also you're saved, unless you believed in vain. What's that mean? Well, let me use other Bible familiarity to you. Um, this morning in my quiet time, I was just reading in Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. One of the commandments uses the phrase, in vain. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. What's that mean? That means without reverent thought, without due respect, if, you know, you say, oh my, and then you throw God's name out, that's not respectful. It's amazing. Lots of people who don't even revere Jesus Christ use his name every day. They use it like a swear word. Okay? You're not to take his name in vain, not to take it flippantly, not to take it without respect or regard. What does it mean here to believe in vain? It's possible you are so familiar with Bible truth, it really is like Charlie Brown's teacher, Jesus died and was buried and rose again, blah, 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 I've heard it all my life. You can grow up knowing the facts and never know the Savior. And I've seen it way too often. Someone said familiarity is the subtle enemy of truth. You can be so familiar with Bible facts, you just totally miss the big picture because you're just inundated with familiarity. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be familiar. But boy, look at Hebrews for a minute. You're in 1 uh, Corinthians. Go to Hebrews chapter 3 for a minute and verse 13. Actually, verses 12 and 13. Hebrews 3, 12 and 13. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You can become hardened, interestingly, through the deceitfulness of sin. The more sin a person gets involved in, the more likely he is to harden his heart against God. Behavior dictates belief. It ought to be belief dictates behavior. But a lot of people, I don't believe in God, and you find out that the life of debauchery they're living is no wonder they don't believe in God. Romans chapter 1 describes it. They didn't like to retain God in their knowledge, neither were thankful. They became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. And they began to work all kinds of sexual perversion. And then it says the men burned in their lust one toward another. And they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. And ultimately they were turned over to a reprobate mind. You know what a reprobate mind is? That's what you're seeing today. People cannot even distinguish between right and wrong. They call evil good and good evil. Gender reassignment surgery. What? You know, uh, uh, the uh, reproductive rights. What's that mean? The right to kill innocent babies in the womb. That's what that means. It's incredible. Our society's flipped on its head. And you know why? We have, we've been acquainted with truth as a society, but we've rejected it. That can happen in church. Okay, so it's interesting. These people, let's go back to the Luke passage. These people immediately received the truth. They positively, they were, they were happy about it. But something happened. Notice, verse, uh, back in verse 13 here, they received the word with joy. They have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. 
Interesting, the word fall away, or the, the phrase fall away there, um, aphistomy, it is our, it was what we transliterate, apostasy. Okay, our English word apostasy. What's apostasy? In New Jersey, I grew up going to a United Methodist church that was apostate. Let me explain. Now, now there are some Methodists that preach the Bible. That is not the realm I grew up in, okay? So I grew up in a typical United Methodist. They had abandoned belief in the Bible as the Word of God. Our ministers were not born again. In fact, I found out later, the ministers I grew up under believed that Jesus was conceived through an illicit relationship between Mary and a Roman soldier. They did not believe in the virgin birth. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Didn't believe the Bible is the word of God. They knew gospel truth. In fact, the town where I went to church, the town where Sarah grew up, Pittman, New Jersey, was an old camp meeting town. And people used to come by train from Philadelphia out to Pittman. She, her family lived in a place called The Grove. The Grove was, was a bunch of cottages that developed around the, uh, the camp meeting in, uh, in Pittman, New Jersey. Pittman was named after an old circuit-riding preacher, by the way. And the song In the Garden was written in Pittman, New Jersey. Interesting history. That's where my dad grew up. And this was an old camp meeting town. Well, the church I grew up, Pittman United Methodist, they did not believe the Bible. So they had known gospel truth. There were old fiery Methodist preachers that had preached, you must be born again. But they departed from it. Okay, that's apostasy. Go back to the Matthew account for a minute. Matthew chapter 13. And uh, the, the explanation here is back in verse number 20, Matthew 13, 20. He that receives seed into stony places, same seed that heareth the word, and anon, again, quickly, immediately, with joy, quickly and, and joyfully receiveth it, yet hath he not root in himself, but doeth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because the word by and by, he's offended. That's an interesting word, offended. Scandalizomai, our word scandalize. That's why I'm mentioning it, scandalize. I got called to preach when I was a 15-year-old. When I was in college, I became aware of the fact that God was directing me into evangelism. I remember people would say, typical of, or ask me as a college kid, what are you going to do when you get out? Oh, I'm going to be an evangelist. Well, this is the time when the Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart scandals were in, in the news everywhere. So when I said I'm going to be an evangelist, like, oh, like Jim Baker. Oh, no, not like that. Not a TV evangelist. I can't tell you, I met so many people that were turned off by what they perceived as Christianity because of men who had let them down. And they're like, I want nothing to do with that. Why, can you blame them? Okay. But scandalize means you knew something, but you were turned off by it. Now, the question arises, is this particular group of people saved or not? It is not stated specifically. I'm of the assumption in this particular case that they're not saved. I cannot prove that conclusively. But I say that based on the terms fall away and um, offended here. And based on the passage we looked at, which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away, I, I don't believe you could lose your salvation. And that's not because I'm a Baptist. I didn't grow up Baptist, all right? But I, I became a Baptist by conviction. I'll tell you why I don't believe you can lose your salvation. Verily, verily, I say to you, he that heareth my word, believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Okay, that's John 5, 24. When you receive Christ as Savior, you already have. You don't get it on layaway. You already have everlasting life. And you're, you're already seated with him in the heavenlies, Ephesians 1, okay? So it's not like if you're a good enough person, hold, hopefully you'll hold out to the end and you'll be saved. No, when you're saved, you're forever saved. But are there people that make professions that were not sincere? Evidently. And that's what he's saying. What exposes it? Interesting, in this parable, time of temptation or persecution, okay? Time of personal troubles or opposition, persecution and opposition, have you known anybody that grew up in church that something very difficult happens in their life and they drop out of church, they turn their back on God, and they want nothing to do with Christianity? I've, I've known too many examples of that. That is a picture of the stony ground. 1 John 2.19, you'll hear this in the morning message too, but it's a message, it's a text worth repeating. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Not everybody who comes to church is saved. Now, I don't say that to be judgmental. I'm just saying the Bible tells us examine ourselves whether we be in the faith. Can you imagine going to church all your life and you've been kidding yourself. 
Well, how do I know? Look, Satan will work hard to make you doubt your salvation. I don't want, I don't want to be a, an instrument of helping people doubt their salvation. But Paul did say, examine yourselves. And I want to tell you something. A lot of people grow up and say, oh, I'm sure I'm fine. I've been, a, I've been a Christian since I was a child. Listen, if you're just trying to put Band-Aids where you need surgery, pay attention. Let God convict your heart. Where do you stand? You know, there are two people that can know for sure you're saved. Obviously God. He knows everything. And in 1 John, he says, his word is written that you may know that you have eternal life. But what if you don't know? Why don't you ask the one person who does know? Lord, do I belong to you? Am I your child? And where do you get the assurance? From his word, from his spirit. But you and I ought to be praying, search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. It's a third type of ground while we're here in Matthew. And it is the thorny ground. I call it smothered seed. Smothered, like mother with an S on the front. Smothered seed. Uh, what is smothered seed? Look at verse 22. He, that, he also that receives seed among the thorns, the seed that heareth the word, the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. All right, notice the seed is sown, the word is heard. That's true every time. Okay, These, these people, like everybody else, have heard it. Now, he uses the analogy here of thorny ground. So the sower is casting seed, hopefully into the plowed ground, sometimes on the wayside ground, sometimes stony ground. Sometimes it would fall among thorns. Where I grew up in Jersey, it used to be that between the fields, the Griffins now have mum fields raising chrysanthemums, but uh, they, had, they had hay fields when I was a kid, and there were th thorny hedgerows grown between the fields. We had hay on one side, and we had corn on the other side. And what was the hedgerow for? It was to prevent wind from eroding the soil. Now, these, these hedgerows had been brought over from Europe, and they were, uh, we, had a, we had a plant called Multiflora rosa, and this really gnarly, thorny bush. And I'll tell you, once in a while, the seed would get chucked up into the thorns, and when that seed took, you might see a little seedling sprout up, but you know, you're not going to grow any corn there. You're not going to grow any hay there because the thorns would literally leach the soil of all its nutrients and sap it of all its moisture. That's the picture that's going on here. Okay, so I wrote down B, the seed is smothered, the word is weakened. The seed is smothered. You use the word suffocate if you want to have fun with your spelling skills. Seed is suffocated, seed smothered, the word's weakened. Jump over to the Luke account, Luke chapter 8, and we're on verse 14 now, Luke 8, 14. That which fell among thorns are they, which, when they've heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. Okay, seed smothered, words weakened. By way of illustration, reminds me of uh, the prophet Ezekiel. I learned this later about Ezekiel. I, I don't think I even remember learning this in college. Ezekiel obviously ministered during the time of the captivity. He particularly had a min ministry with the young people and the children in mind. I found that interesting. My wife does children's ministry all the time with my daughter, Heather. And, and why was he focused on children? He ministered during the 70 years captivity, and his focus was not on the people that would die in Babylon. His focus was on the kids who were going to go back to the land. And very interestingly, he used elaborate object lessons. He would act out things. Apparently quite a dynamic preacher. I give you that as background. Listen to this, Ezekiel chapter 33 Verses, uh, sorry, it's chap yeah, chapter 33, verses 30 to 33. They come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come, then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. Interesting, I skipped the first part. Um, people come saying, here I pray you, what is the word that cometh forth unto the, from the Lord? And they come unto thee as the people cometh. It's like when I was a kid growing up, we'd go hear some famous preacher speak, you know, Dr. So-and-so, Evangelist so-and-so, we'd load up. Nothing wrong with that, but it's like, man, this guy can shuck the corn. This guy can deliver the goods, right? And a lot of times that had more to do with this style of delivery than necessarily the substance, okay? Now, I, I've heard plenty of preachers that had a dynamic delivery and great substance. I'm not disregarding that. But sometimes we're like, man, hold my attention, preacher. And, but these people said, that guy is equal. He can deliver it, but they had no intention of obeying it. 
listen, we're not here to hold up numbers like, was that an 8.5 message? Was that a 9? Was that, you know, boy, that was, you hit it out of the park, preacher. Okay, I hope to deliver good messages, but the point of the message is not how dynamic or interesting it was. How transformative is it? And God told Ezekiel, yeah, they're coming. They're going to come in mass, and I want them to come hear you, but here's the problem. Don't be deceived by crowds. Just because the crowd's big doesn't mean the response is large. So, interesting here, we're told in the Luke account that uh, what is it that chokes the word? He mentions cares, riches, and pleasures. Cares. How many of you have ever done caregiving for a family member? Anybody ever do caregiving? Yeah. My mom passed away in January of 22. And for the last four months of her life, my sister and I took turns being caregivers. My sister had been living at her house, but at, a, at the very end of her time, she was battling cancer and early dementia. And um, in the very latter four months of her life, my sister and I would take turns, one each night. My mom didn't want to sleep in the hospice bed they'd brought in. She slept in the recliner. So we slept in the hospice bed next door, in, in the living room at home. And I will tell you, I only did it for four months. It's exhausting. And I know some of you have been doing it for years. The word cares does not necessarily mean carnal concerns. It's just you can be distracted with cares. What, what does uh, Philippians say? Be careful for how much? Nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Philippians 4, 6. Don't let the cares burden you down. That's not easy to do, right? Cares, then riches. Riches can distract. Let me just say to you, if you're an American, you're rich. Brother, uh, I'm on welfare. You know, I get government. I don't care. If you're an American, you're rich. I'm not kidding. You're coming through our southern border. You're getting free cell phones and a couple thousand dollars, more than the people that suffered the Maui fires are getting, unbelievably. Another story for another time. Listen, if you're in this country, you're rich. That's why everybody wants to come here. I've, I've been to countries abroad. I remember going to um, the Philippines. No, I'm sorry. I was in Canada. Talked to a missionary from the Philippines. I said, what did it cost you to fly to America or North America? He said, uh, $1,200 back then. That was 15 years ago. I said, wow, that's a lot of money. He said, for my people, that's a year's salary. $1,200. $100 a month. That was what his people got. I'm in Africa, Ghana, Africa, talking to a friend of mine as a missionary. and said, Mike, what do your people earn? He said, 300 bucks A month? A year. 300 a year. Let me just tell you, in this country, you, you can make $300, you know, doing a day of lawn service. And let me just suggest to you that in America, we're rich. And we are distracted. We have every gadget imaginable. It's amazing. All these conveniences have given us more time. So what do we do? We fill our lives with more stuff, with more busyness. Cares riches, and pleasures. Pleasures does not necessarily mean sensual pleasures. It's not just necessarily um, sinful pleasures. Well, you know, I, I, I should read the Bible every day. I know we've got a couple hours we'll spend on social media or watching television or in our favorite activities, but we don't have time to spend with God. Cares, riches, pleasures, choke the word. Now, is, is this type of ground representative of a saved person or not? I mean, I wade through that. I, I, before I ever crack open a commentary, I'll tell you this. I always, I always uh, pray about a passage. You know, if you, before you call your pastor, like, pastor, I'm really struggling. Parable of the sower, thorny ground saved or not? Before you call pastor, before you crack open a commentary, how about you talk to the author? You know him. What a privilege. Talk to the author. And I said, Lord, I don't, I don't want to come to wrong conclusions on this, and I don't want to be dogmatic about something I shouldn't be. I'm just trying to figure this out. Well, he prompted my heart. You know, in the multitude of counselors, there's safety, there's wisdom. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go to the commentaries and see what the consensus is. Commentators are about split right down the middle on whether this represents a saved or an unsaved person. I thought, well, that didn't help me any. Well, actually, it did. Actually, it did. What it made me realize is I don't think the point of this um, illustration parable that Jesus gave here was to say saved or lost. He was saying it doesn't matter if you're a saved person who's backslidden or an unsaved person. Cares, riches, and pleasures can choke the word. You can make application to both a regenerate person and an unregenerate person. 
What I can tell you with dogmatic conviction is God is warning us not to let cares, riches, and pleasures choke the word. That could happen to keep you from being saved, and it can happen once you are saved to keep you from being fruitful. The first two are pretty clear to me that they're not saved. This one, I could flip a coin on it and say saved or not. I don't mean to be that flippant about theology. I'm just saying I can't tell you with dogmatism saved or not. I can tell you dogmatically God doesn't want you to be the person who lets cares, riches, and pleasures choke the word in his life. I, I would probably lean toward thinking it's depictive of a person who's come to salvation, has gotten distracted, but you want to make the other case, fine, no, no problem. I think you can make a good case the other way. What you and I will agree with is God warns us, don't let distracting influences keep you from letting the word have its primary influence in your life. But there's one type of ground here and that remains, and that's the good ground. While you're in Luke, just take a look at verse uh, 15. That on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Let's finish up in Matthew then, Matthew 13, and we're back in verse 23, Matthew 13, 23. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. All right, the good ground. I call this secured seed, secured seed. Before I went to Christian school when I was a kid, I played football growing up. That was my favorite sport, and I remember it was tackle football, helmets, shoulder pads, all that. And I remember as a kid, I'm in 6th, 7th, 8th grade. No, I'm sorry, 4th, 5th, 6th grade when I was playing tackle football. And the very first thing they taught us in football is you've got to secure the football. It's, it's an odd shape. You know, it's, it's, this football is pointed at both ends, round in the middle, and it is not easy to hold on to a football. And they were teaching us, grade school kids, if you catch the ball, you've got to secure it. If you're a running back, you've got to hold on to it. If you recover a fumble, secure the ball. In football, you have to have possession of the ball. And I mean, they drilled us. I watched these guys, and I'm from Kansas City. Listen, I've been a Kansas City Chiefs fan for 30 years, okay? Terrible times, good times. I'm excited that they're in the Super Bowl. Believe me, I've lived through lots of years when they weren't. So I'm an avid football fan. I will watch football games and I'll think, hold the ball, man. I learned that when I was in, you know, grade school. And I'll see guys carry it like it's a loaf of bread. Okay, that's football. We get passionate about that if we're football fans, right? How much more do we need to be passionate about holding on to the truth that we've been given from the pulpit? When we've read something in the Bible, like, oh, that was good. Hey, write that down. Meditate on it. Secure it. Don't just let Satan snatch it away. How often have you walked out of a revival meeting, your heart was convicted? You might have even gone up to the altar in response. You walk out the door and you're totally on to the next thing. What are you going to do this week to secure the word? So notice, I wrote down, the seed is sown, the word is heard. I've said that four times now, but then the seed is secured, the word is welcomed. What are you going to do to secure the seed this week? One thing I suggest is taking notes. Now, I will do my part to give you a, a structure to follow along. I just kind of, an, I kind of like to organize my thoughts. That's not the only way to preach. It's just how I like to do it. But I, I like to do unto others as ha have them do unto me. When I listen to preaching, I want to be able to follow along. So I take notes whenever somebody else is preaching because I want to follow the flow of thought. Plus, if I want to go back to it, I, I, oh, yeah, I remember, yeah, yeah, that was that passage. Boy, that point changed my life. So what are you going to do to secure the seed? Let me suggest put away distractions, okay? Let me suggest get, get some rest. Hard to do in a work week, I know. But whatever you can do to say, God, you have my full, utter attention. When it's time to read the Bible, now, I live in a fifth-wheel trailer. I have to tell you, eliminating distractions for me, I can't make them all go away. We all share the space together. Sometimes I'll have to put on quiet music. I was listening to some classical music yesterday to just create a quietness. So you can't always have total quiet. But eliminate distractions. And then look at this. When the, when the word is heard, I wrote, the ground is prepared, the word is understood, and fruit is born. That's what makes this good ground. Word, the ground is pre prepared, word is understood, fruit is born. You're not going to understand without thinking. I love this about the Bereans. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. You probably know that's... Acts 17, 11. They received the word readily and they searched it diligently. That ought to be our approach every time the word is preached, okay? But notice then, fruit's born. There's fruit. 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Okay, think about it. When you plant seeds, what do you grow? It depends what you plant. If you plant apple seeds, you're going to get apple trees. If you plant corn seeds, you get corn. If you plant orange seeds, you get orange trees. 
Okay, well, the fruit of Christians is, should be other Christians. Now, there should be the fruit of the Spirit in your life, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's what the Spirit of God produces. But the whole idea is other Christians. For, when I walked in today, I, I keep a track uh, binder in my pocket, and I went to your track rack, and I immediately picked up a couple of tracks. So, you know, these don't do any good on the rack back there. These need to be given and put in people's hands. So I, I tell people, hey, I want to share with you the best relationship I've ever found in my life is a relationship with God. You can simply find ways to sow seed this week. So you say, Lord, I want to see fruit. I love this idea. Not everybody's equally productive, but I'll tell you what, everybody ought to be hungry to be a hundredfold production. Some 30-fold, some 60, some 100. I want you to do this. Let's, uh, let's close the Bible for a minute. Let's just put our notes aside. I want to bow our heads as we wrap up. We've got about a minute left in Sunday school here. Let's just bow our heads. And I want to, I want to do a little inventory here, okay? Father, I pray, like, like David petitioned you, search me, oh God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. With our heads bowed, I want to ask you this. How many here might have to say, you know, I'm afraid, Rich, that I'm the the wayside ground. I've, I've known the truth, you know, I've been exposed to it, but I've never really received the word into a properly prepared heart. I don't, I frankly admit, I've never been saved. I've really not been interested in being saved. But as you're going through this today, I'm afraid that I may be the wayside ground. Is there anybody like that? I will not embarrass you, but you'd acknowledge, please pray for me. I'm afraid that's where I am. Anybody like that today? Okay. We looked at the the uh, stony ground, not much deepness of earth, person who lets persecution and tribulation cause them to become hardened. Probably the application is a person who was familiar with Bible truth but never got genuinely saved. That may be you. Or it may be along the way you just let similar distractions get a hold of you, persecution, tribulation, and you just became a spiritual shipwreck. The primary application is someone who knew the truth and initially received it emotionally positive, but then turned away. Is there anybody here you say, I'm afraid I'm, I'm the stony ground? Would you hold up your hand? Pray for me. I'm afraid that's me. Okay. The third type of ground is the thorny ground. Now listen, cares, riches, pleasures, none of these things necessarily inherently evil. How many of us would say, I'm afraid I have let other things choke the word? Anybody there see yourself and say, pray for me? I, I see that in me. Anybody? I see a lot of hands now. Okay. Okay. Now, how many of you would say, I, I believe by God's grace I'm the good ground? Now, I don't mean that I'm perfect and I sure would like to see more fruit, but I, I am saved and I've seen evidence of it, and, and frankly, I do hunger for more. How many of you would say, I, I don't say this proudly, thank God, I do believe that that's that's overall true in my life. Would you hold up your hand? Okay. Now, here's what I'd like to ask. Would you all now look up at me? So I went through each type of ground, right? And I would estimate that maybe between one-third and one-fourth of the entire group confessed to being one of those three, or four, okay? I'm not doing this to trick you. I, do, I know exactly how this is going to play out when I ask. You may say, well, I don't know which of those I am. That's the problem. I'll grant you that. <coughs> Guess who does know which type of ground you are? The fact remains, you are one of those types of ground. By God's grace, you don't have to remain in the obstinate group or the disinterested group, but every one of us is one of those types of ground. And the reason Jesus gave the parable of the sower, he says, look, Rich, you're sowing the seed. The word's good no matter what happens. I'll, I'll walk out of here with a clean conscience this week knowing I preach the word of God. But that's not all I want to do. I want to see God do a work in you. And we've got to cooperate together. We've got to cooperate with God. In order for there to be fruit, the word's got to be received in a properly prepared ground. You listen great. Thank you. Let's let God prep our heart. Pastor, shall I dismiss or shall you? All right. So we've got 13 minutes and